the land of the rising sun, east of the Niger, from the continent of Africa, a ministry was born to change the world. Dominion mandate is God's universal human right. This is the right he gave to every human being on it. The universal human right is the dominion mandate. The dominion mandate is a calling given to mankind. That mandate crowns you a king over creation. Welcome to Expand Your World with Pastor David Ogwili. We are talking about salvation, genetic salvation, genetic salvation. I open this discussion on Sunday, I want you to know that um, in every battle of life, there are three major formulas. Sun Tzu, one of the, you know, experts in warfare, I think he's a Chinese expert, is one of their leaders that has passed. He wrote a book, The, the Art of War. Am I correct? He said, in every battle, know yourself. Know your enemy. And then we always add, know your weapons. Then in a thousand battle, you will never suffer one defeat. The first is self-awareness. You have to know your strength. You have to know your weaknesses. The reason people, the number one reason people lose battles is that they are blinded to themselves. Sometimes they are aware of their strength, but they are blinded to their weaknesses. And those weaknesses, it's exactly what your enemy will exploit. There are four sides to every person. But before I, or I, I mention that, because it's war that we're about to do tonight. It's a first you know yourself. Self-awareness is where it all begins. Then number two, you need to know your enemy. You can be fighting the wrong person because the mystery is that the devil is the master of camouflage. To destroy husband and wife, he can appear to you in a dream with your wife's face chasing you. This is how the spiritual world, the negative supernatural operates. Because what makes the devil strong is the ability to hide. The ability to deceive. The ability to lie. The first key to destroying the devil is unmasking him. He always operates like a masquerade. He puts a cover. You know what we do when we are small? You want these two guys to fight. You come from behind. You touch this one this way and look away. Then he turns, he looks at this guy. He will keep quiet the first time. Then when you watch that he's not looking, you touch him again and look away. Then he turns to the guy and holds his head. Can you people see your fight has started? The person who sowed the seed is somewhere else. And that's why we don't win many battles because... We are busy fighting shadows while the substance has escaped. We are busy fighting shadows and the substance has escaped. When you finish emptying your bullet on shadows, what is the amazing thing is that in spiritual warfare, that spirit takes another person, repeats the cycle again. That's why the Bible teaches us, he said, for we wrestle not against what? Flesh and blood. So how are you now saying that your mother is your enemy? How are you now saying that it's your own father that is your enemy? How are you now saying that it's your own brother that is your enemy? When the Bible is even telling you that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, there are forces out there. For example, the scripture said in Revelation chapter 5 that we have on the day Jesus was coronated, the day he was made king of kings after he rose from the dead, they attended the coronation service 
was attended by 100 trillion angels. Everyone said that word. 100 trillion. You see your, your Bible, Revelation chapter 5, I can show it to you. But the fact, the point I want to make is if we have 100 trillion and that might not be all the angels because there were human beings on earth when he ascended. He left about 500 disciples. 120 were at the upper room praying why that coronation was taking place. If So all of the things going on on earth, there were still angels here protecting things. But let's assume that that is all the angels that God has. The Bible said he has innumerable, uncountable number of angels. But let's assume that that's all the angels he has. The scripture said the devil, when he fell, left with one thought. So if we have 100 trillion on God's side, obviously we have about 50 trillion. How many human beings do we have? 7 billion. Divide 50 trillion by 7. You can understand the number of demons that are available at your service. Now, you can now understand if one of them was driving a madman in the Bible crazy. And, they, you know, the, the one madman had a legion. That's what the Bible said. Jesus sent out of one person a legion, a legion. And a legion is 6,000. It's possible that there is somebody here who has as much as 6,000 on your case. Because the tougher the issue, the more the level of spiritual wickedness that is involved. Jesus was talking about deliverance. He said, when you cast the devil out of a person, they walk around looking for new accommodation. But if they don't find, they usually, after some time, revisit the person they left. That's why people tell you, I was healed. Uh, two years after, the thing came back. Because they got deliverance, but did not learn how to keep it. He said they will revisit the person, but this time they're outside. When they come, they find the house empty, clean, and swept. But there is nothing occupying it. Instead of going in to take back the house, he goes and gets several more spirits, more wicked. That means some are more wicked than others. Some demons are more wicked. There are some problems you have, and it's a smaller level of demon that is on that case. And that will show the level of things that are manifesting. There are some other cases you have. is a more vicious type. You know, like sickness, for example. All the bacteria, some are more vicious than others. The cancer virus or the HIV virus. It's not the same thing as malaria. I hope you know what I'm talking about. But all of them are destructive forces. Some demons are more vicious than others. That devil will go and, and find stronger ones that are more wicked to come and join him. They will now go and take that house. And according to Jesus, he said that man's state will be worse than the other. Maybe the other time there was no fasting needed. This time you might need fasting to cast it out. So, 80% of the afflictions of men are demonic in origin. I want to repeat that. 80% of the afflictions you see in life are demonic in origin. Over 50 trillion. Having thousands available to focus on one person. So the Bible says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against all powers. So where do we begin to lose the battles of life? We end up fighting with flesh and blood. The amazing thing is that, let's assume that you succeed in getting rid of that one. He enters another person. Because Satan will always find somebody. But if you have focused your bullet to burn the powers, then even the head of the person who was using will clear. Because you can see that in a particular case, Jesus sent them out of the madman, they entered the pig, and they destroyed the pig. In some cases, having dealt with it spiritually, 
they will destroy themselves and that person alongside. They happen sometimes. That's why all this kill your enemy, fall down and die. What the Bible said is forgiveness. Forgive your enemy. There is a new breed, a corruption of Christianity that is spreading now like virus. Fall down and die. Every enemy must die. The real enemy escapes because he is not touched. It's human beings you are killing that Jesus Christ died for. He said, if your enemy is hungry, give him food. Your enemy is thirsty, give him water. We have left the teachings of Christianity. We're now practicing witchcraft because of false prophets and deceivers that are loose in these last days. And they are the ones that a lot of people like to go and listen to. On your mother's side, on your father's side, that's where. At the end of the day, they scattered families, torn brothers against brothers, parents divide parents. That's what is going on in these last days. The gospel of bondage. Men that God called and gave dominion are now ruled by fear, ruled by sus suspicion, ruled by deception. That's what is going on. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. It is the gospel that saves. It is the gospel that seals. It is the gospel that delivers. What is going on now is the gospel of bondage. Your sister is a witch. Your mother is a witch. He carries his mother to the place. But now, you know, those ones are even good because... If you, are, if, you are, if you want to serve God, you can easily tell because the kind of places they do their business. Water side, red garment, white garment. Today now, they are, all, they are dressed in suits. They dress like real pastors. They sing the praise and worship songs you sing. The same thing. But they trade this gospel of bondage. They're on TV. They're on satellites. Genetic salvation is actually tracing that deliverance from everything that came through everything that came through inheritance, everything that came through your bloodline, everything that came through genes. We know some of them, like in the physical sickle cell, for example, is a genetic disease. But, but, but diabetes can be from the family line. There are a couple of other things. You can see that the sin that we are, when we are born, we are born sinners. All of us are born sinners. A, a baby that is born today is a sinner. David said, in sin did my mother conceive me. Now, you can see that that sin is also inherited. For whom did we get it? Adam. So our tendency for rebellion, because Adam rebelled against God, and that caused the fall of man. That, since that day, the thing has been transferring down. You can see that the first two children that, were, that came out of that marriage, the Cain killed his brother. Nobody has ever committed murder before this time. How did somebody learn murder? And before he committed murder, he had envy against his brother. His own brother. Now, that Adamic nature is part of our genetic problem. Our propensity for evil. Do you know each time I see security men carrying all these heavy weapons, I ask myself, who are we being protected from? Is it from lion? Maybe there's python on the road that will swallow the pastor. Who, who is that? Who is this dangerous person that makes us need security? A human being like you. All the evil on earth is a man. Why? Because these demons are spirit beings. They've lost their physical bodies. So now they enter people enter people. They cannot achieve their goals unless they find somebody's body they can take. Now here is the mystery about this. I was showing you on Sunday. I showed you the triangle of salvation. I wish you can draw it on the board. Salvation. That salvation. Show that scripture again. First Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 23. May the Lord God of peace sanctify you wholly. And the Bible also talks about total salvation, total sanctification, total deliverance. Sanctify you wholly. That's total. And he said, may your whole spirit. So salvation has a three-dimensional 
side to it. One is the salvation of the human spirit. The other is the salvation of the soul. The final is the salvation of the body. Okay. No sickness there. But where was the problem in the body? When the Bible said, may the Lord God sanctify you holy. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless till Jesus returns back. Till the coming of the Lord. He's saying, I don't just want you to be saved, born again, and then you have sickness in your body. I want your body healthy till Jesus returns. I want your mind sound. There are people carrying born again spirit with an unsound mind. If you see the kind of filthy thinking that comes out of their head. The kind of dirty things they think about. Because that is how somebody might be going to church, but the soul is filled with death and evil and cobwebs. And one day you do certain things and people say, ah, but he's supposed to be born again. No. His spirit may be born again, but the soul has not been saved. The salvation of the spirit is instant. The moment you give your life to Christ, repent of your sin, that happened. The salvation of the soul is a process. It doesn't happen instantly. And there are three dimensions to the soul. You have the will. Some people are so stubborn. Why? Their will has not been redeemed. To redeem your will, you have to do what Jesus did at the Gethsemane. I surrender my will, O oh God, to your will. I make your word the final authority in my life. I surrender my agenda to your agenda. Not my will, oh God, but your will. When you bring your will under the control of the word of God, under the control of God, the spirit of God, it means you're brought in the Holy Spirit to take over the steering of your life. It means you cannot be stubborn anymore. You cannot be. Remember that when salvation comes, that the Bible said, a new spirit will I put within them. A new heart will I put within them. And one of the things God said he would take away is the heart of stone. There are people, it's stubbornness, rebellion. Nobody can. Your will. So he's saved, his spirit is saved, but the will is not touched. He does whatever he likes. Whatever God likes, let him write in the Bible. So he doesn't have brokenness. It doesn't have surrenderedness. All this song we sing does not mean anything in his life. Because the song said, I surrender all. I surrender all. Unto thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. And it is with that will that Adam rebelled against God. And it is with the same will that all of the rebellion and disobedience occurs. When my will is submitted to his will, the word of God now has authority to govern me. What about the mind? The mind is another thing. You can let your mind be filled with junk. And the amazing thing about the mind is that it's garbage in, garbage out. You put, it's like your system, your, your, your laptops. It's input, output, cycle. If you load the word of God in there, it produces the right behavior out of you. If you load junks, that's why these preachers that tread on superstition, you go there and sit down and, and they load your mind with fear, with superstition. After a while, you are programmed. Because a human being is like a system. You are a highly programmable being. You are programmed negatively. You are programmed with suspicion. You don't trust anybody. And you live your life like that. And you mess up relationships. Because you're not going anywhere in life without it. But you have the Bible. You have God's software. You can program yourself for success. You can program yourself for victory. There are godly books. There are good messages. Because what you hear is what you become. If you keep hearing it. If you keep hearing it, you become it. It's like in the physical. What you eat is what you become, physically speaking. Stop wondering where your uh, big tummy came from. It came from food. What you eat is what you, your health is dependent on that. 
but you eat too with your mouth physically, but inwardly you eat with your ears. What you hear is what you become. That's why the Bible said, take heed what you hear. You should pay heed to what is sound doctrine. Now, what about the emotion? Emotion is another side. For somebody to be saved in his soul, what about the emotion? Emotion is the one that can retain hurt, anger, bitterness, malice, or affection. Positive mindset. You know, you can have the positive one, or you can let your emotion be filled with those negative things. The scripture teaches forgiveness. He said offenses will come. People hurt you. It's part of life. But you hear the person keep forgives and, and goes on. Somebody promised you marriage and failed you. Because of that, you now declare all men devils. And if finally one comes into your life, I don't know where you have declared them all devils. Choose not to marry. Die single. Because you have flat tire. You repair your tire, you continue. You are exhaust. Sometimes mess up, you repair it, you continue. Relationship also sometimes flattens. Repair it and continue. And where it's not removed, repairable. Remove the tire, put a new one and continue. So a relationship failed. That's not the reason you declare all relationship evil. Bob die every day. You change them, you continue. You don't declare electricity evil. Jesus said offenses will come because just like you offend people, that's how people offend you. Human beings are imperfect. If you like, let it be your twin brother or twin sister. If you like, let it be the wife that you love like Romeo and Juliet. You can die for her. That your wife will hurt you many times. Anybody that stays married to you for 10 years is somebody that has forgiven you for a thousand times. And the same way people hurt you, that's how you've been hurting people. Oh. That people still greet you is because people have been forgiving you. That people still see you and call you a human being is because people have been forgiving you. And the most amazing thing is that the whole program of redemption is based on forgiveness. If God did not forgive us, all of us are doomed. So he now put it there. If you don't forgive your brother, neither will your heavenly father forgive you. But that's the one the enemy comes now. You see, a lot of people, that's why we do deliverance till today. You know why there are deliverance, demons coming out of Christians? The soul. The devil enters people through their emotion, hearts. Now, Jesus said, let not the sun go down on your anger. But they will carry it for one week, some nine months, one year. We are even finding out now that people can carry for five years, ten years. And then what does he do? The heart opens the person to be accommodated by evil spirits. They enter and take residence in a human being. And then, when the behavior shows up, you see that the person is no more a Christian. When he talks, that's not a Christian. When he acts, that's no more a believer. A Christian is governed by the nature of God. Love, joy, peace. Long suffering, they endure gentleness. Now, this person now is erratic. This person can't do anything. How did he get there? The devil either entered in through his emotion or he entered in through his mind, the thoughts, some things. And the devil is the master of at altering perception. That's what he does. That's the business. That's why, at the end of the day, the way the Bible summarizes it. Is the, and the devil that deceived the whole world. Everyone said that. Think about it. Billion, seven billion people. Even those of us professing Christianity, one or two times he played tricks on you. The devil that deceived the whole world was cast into the lake of fire. That means that's where he succeeds the most. Altering perception. He can turn what is white and make it black in your own eyes. And in your eyes is black, oh, it doesn't mean it's black. Let me say it. You see the world the way you are, not the way it is. Stop thinking that the way you look at things is the way it is. It's the way you are. When you are bitter, everything is bitter in your eyes. When you are hot and disoriented, you see things negatively. It doesn't mean that that's the reality. 
You know when you wear a goggle, like all this green one or blue one, you look at it everywhere, the world is blue. Then when you wear the green, the world is green. It doesn't mean it's your own goggle that is coloring perception. And the most dangerous thing about perception is that perception is stronger than reality. Because until it's corrected, that man, that's what forms his worldview. That's what forms his worldview. Until Jesus, I mean, Judas betrayed Christ and saw him arrested and being killed. His perception did not clear. He actually believed that the man was. You know why? A woman brought some money and broke a alabaster box of oil and was pouring it on the feet of Jesus. And he, he complained that the money should be given to the poor. And Jesus corrected him openly. He didn't do it privately. You can go and read it in John chapter 12. Openly. In the presence of the other disciples, he took offense. That hurt, that offense, is what finally led him to go and join with his enemy, betray him, sell him for 30, 30 pieces of silver. But after, after the, Jesus was arrested, they were now tormenting him. Judas' eyes closed. How did that, remember the Bible said, and the devil entered him. How did the devil enter him? Through his emotion. A hurt, a wounded emotion. Now, somebody that used to be preaching the gospel, casting out the devil, an apostle now is a demon walking about, but he doesn't know. He's filled with hate. He's filled with envy. And he wants this guy dead. The same used to tell everybody that he was a messiah. He now wants to destroy the same organization he built. And the same tribe with Jesus, he was even his brother. He felt hot at the correction that he was making a good contribution. And his opinion was not listened to. And that was it. The scripture said, you don't let the sun go down. God is not saying that people won't hurt you or that you, you, you know, that the hurt will not be painful. It happens. But he said, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Because what happens is that when you carry it, it becomes like a wound. Have you ever seen where there is a sore in your leg or somewhere in your body? But the surface is covered. Eh? But the thing is growing inside, festering. Then it develops pus. Sometimes if you put poke it open, the pus will come out from the other side. And then it can develop. I have prayed for a man whose own now got to a point. He ate the whole leg up. That his bones now, this bone, is now open and flies were perching on him. It, it, it started small and developed into a dangerous gangrene. Now that's what oh, kabaya, le, 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 kobo, 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 lomo, hiba, kuya, ya. Hebrews chapter 12. Let me show you. You see what a little heart can now develop into something extremely dangerous. Hebrews chapter 12. First of all, I want to show us condition for making heaven. If you, if you want to go to hell, you have to keep breaking this law. But if you want to go to heaven, these are the condition. For the unbeliever, the message is give your life to Christ. Repent of your sin. To the one that is professing to be a Christian, these are the conditions. There are two. Live at pe follow peace with all men. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no eye can see God. One is reconciliation. Peace. Anytime you see that word in the scripture, it means reconciliation. Everyone say peace. Means what? Reconciliation. It means forgiveness. It is what uh, Mandela preached in South Africa. The other side is holiness. It means living a life that is godly, that is pleasing God. He's staying away from sin. There are people, like the lady, I was sharing the tape. I played it with my family. I played it for Pastor Sarah. The, pa the pastor, the lady pastor in Benin, who then by a house, who died and went to hell. Living godly. Holiness is not the, the problem. When she got there, they sent her to hell. What was the issue? Quarrel with the husband. Jesus said, you can't settle with your husband here. You want to come to heaven here. He said, it's not possible. It's there in your Bible. Anybody that hates his brother is a murderer. You are like Cain. That's what the Bible said. 
anybody that hates his brother is a murderer. Hatred in, in New Testament is equals to murder. You are committing the sin of murder. And he said, no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Follow peace with all men. That's the aspect of love, you know, reconciliation. Then the aspect of godliness and doing what is right in the sight of one has to do with human beings. The other has to do with God. These are the two conditions for heaven. If you remember the Ten Commandments, love the Lord your God with all your heart, love your neighbor as what? Those are the two. On this hangs all the law and the prophets. He said, without which no eye shall see the Lord. Then look at verse 15. He said, look, we have to be very careful about this statement. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. So, the grace of God is what saved me. But this is how people can fall from that grace and end up in hell. Wow! Number one, lest any root of bitterness spring up and trouble you. Everyone say root of bitterness. How does he get there? It usually, it might be a small word. Somebody says something. It might be somebody did something. Or somebody whatever. But then, you take it because it's the emotion, the soul, that is not renewed. It festers like a, a small wound. Then you brood on it. Like that saw. It will develop root. Root. Bitterness that has now grown root. Unforgiveness that now has tap root. And it defies the man. The inside of the person becomes dirty. The soul is like a dirty toilet. Evil spirits now come there because you have created a habitat for them. That's the kind of place they live. It defies the man's soul. You will know what I'm talking about if you read First Corinthians, um, Matthew chapter 15, where Jesus talked about the man that was owed something in the Bible, the parable. He was being owed by his servant. And, and he brought the man and said, pay me what you're owing me. And he couldn't pay. So he ordered him to be jailed, put in prison. But he fell down and begged the man and said, forgive me. So the master canceled the debt. Okay. As he left that place, he found another servant. He put them as servants. Another servant that was owing him one tiny amount of money. He was owing his master in millions. I can look at it for you, you see. Now he finds somebody that was owing him a few change. And he tells the guy to pay. The guy couldn't pay. He grabbed him, bound him, and put him in prison. When his master now heard it, he now reversed. He called him. He said, you were owing me such a huge amount of money, and I forgave you. But you saw a fellow servant like yours, and it was just that small change. You refused to forgive him. Then he makes a statement. He said, hand him over to tormentors. Everyone said that word, tormentors. That's where demons come in through unforgiveness. That's how bitterness opened up for demons. I showed you in Judah's case. It opens the door. Evil spirits now enter and mess up the man's life. Now, remember how I started. Know yourself. Know your enemy. Do you know the amazing thing about the devil? At that moment where these things are going on, the person will never look inward. He will be busy looking for who his enemy is. That's the mystery about devils. They mask their work. They destroy the person when they feel they take on another. He said, hand him over to tormentors and they will torture him till he has paid the last. That's why when we ask for forgiveness, we say, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Because sin is a debt. And the punishment for that is death. He said, the wages of sin is death. And we can't pay. That's why the Son of God died for us. But he now expects us to forgive others. His Lord was angry and delivered him to the tormentors. Look at it, Matthew 18, verse 34. Till he should pay all that was due to him. And look at verse 35, what Jesus said there. He says, so likewise shall my heavenly Father do also to you if you from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother. There are trespasses. That's what God does. He, op he removes his protection. Evil spirit come in. And all kinds of torment starts. All types.
Go back to Hebrews 12. Verse 24 said, follow peace with all men with, and with holiness. Without with no eye shall see God. Verse 20, 15. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up and trouble you, thereby many be defiled. Scripture say your brother offend you, tell him his offense. And then you reconcile and you gain your brother. I have noticed that relationship becomes stronger. Love is deeper after reconciliation than it was before it. Am I correct? Those of you who have married for some years will know what I'm talking about. After that, the relationship deepens, it matures. According to Jesus, say you gain your brother. He becomes your asset. You don't practice reconciliation. You create an enemy. The worst enemy to have is your former friend who knows you well. The worst enemy to have is your brother. The worst enemy to have is enemy enemy within. Not the one without. The best form of security is peace with your neighbor. Reconciliation is not weakness, it's strength. You see, for America, it's better that the Al Qaeda is in the Middle East instead of them becoming Canada. That's why they sign covenants, not Atlantic treaties, so that they can keep peace with all their surrounding nations. Let the enemy be the fire. Haven't you noticed that all this war, they say war in Afghanistan, war in, uh, in Iraq, war in. Don't you know that it's in somebody's territory that the war is happening? That both civilians and soldiers are paying for it? When there is war, let it not be in your own territory. May war never happen at your own doorpost. I say may war never come to your own doorpost. Let it be on your enemy's doorpost. Because all the bombs and all the whatever, they will be the ones suffering the casualties. I know sometimes soldiers from the invading country also have casualties. But that's mine no. Compared to if it's happening in your own country. Can you imagine if Iraqi war was in America? America fighting with Iraqi soldiers. All the refineries bombed will be American refineries. All the roads bombed will be American roads. All the houses bombed will be American houses. The worst form of enemy to have is one with him or the one nearby. The one that knows you well. Jesus teaches reconciliation. And then you have the salvation of the body which is keeping us healthy. Keeping us safe. Protected. Till Jesus comes to take us. No death by accident. No death by sickness. No cancer. No HIV. And if you are sick tonight, I'm going to rebook that. It's going to leave your body. God said, I want to preserve blameless spirit, soul, and body. Till the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't open your soul for the devil. There are emotional torments. Do you know that bitterness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die? I want to say it again. Bitterness is, is drinking poison while expecting the other one to die. The person you are angry with sometimes is even going out because there are even cases where people are bitter against you and you don't even know that you have offended them. Because people offend willfully and sometimes unknowingly. Am I correct? There are times somebody tells you how you offended him and you don't even know that you did it. But what the Bible said is that if somebody tells you that you did that, apologize to him. Oh. Gain your brother. Gain your brother. Is the stronger person that says I'm sorry. Is the wiser person that says I'm sorry. Is the weaker person that is proud, giving arrogance. You see, meekness is no weakness. It is strength under control. So, 
when you deal with genetic salvation, the first place to start is with the sin and the problems we inherited from Adam. And I don't have the time. Next time I come, I might get into that. In our crowd, we had to deal with it. For example, for the women, there are three problems you've got for Eve. For the men, there are three problems they've got. You know men's problem, they're universal. PMS, power, money, and sex. You see, sexual temptation is every man's battle. It's his struggle to make it financially. It's every man's battle. I'm not saying that women sometimes don't have temptation for sex. So after all, do men do it without women? I'm not saying that women too, especially in this 21st century where they are thrown into the career war, struggling to earn money, don't have challenges with No, it's men's battle. In toiling, you're going to make your living. Eat bread. That's as a result of Adam. And the other one is power. Men want respect. Men want dignity. Starting with their own home. From their wife. If you're a wise woman, don't contend with your wife, your husband. Don't, you can do anything and get away with it from a man. Don't touch his ego. You see why men go to war? Ego. Sometimes they know they are wrong. Bro. Humility is part of the big problem. To be the one to say I'm sorry. But men are egocentric. Because the problem of Adam was rebellion. Induced by his wife and the wife induced by Satan. Power, money, and sex. You see the fight over polit political power. In the companies, I see how fight over who will be the MD, who will be the... That's why men like titles. I saw somebody, he was reverend, doctor, professor, you know, apostle. Men's problem. What about women? First thing he said, I'll put enmity between there and the woman. Who is it? D? Satan. Demons. Do men, are men harassed by demons? Yes. But for the woman, there's a special hatred between the devil and the woman. And the amazing thing is that Many ladies fall in love with a serpent thinking the serpent likes them. That's why in every 10 deliverance case, seven are women. What is the second reason why women have more deliverance problem than men? Because all this emotional problem I'm discussing, hearts, bitterness, malice, envy, is more of the women problem. Men fight. When they finish, they drop the sword. Next time you see them playing rudo or soccer. Women, 10 years after, that woman, ah! Even in secondary school, as small as they are in class, envy. She made, she was came first in the class, envy. You will see girls discussing her. See her. She wears a nice dress, envy. Girls will sit down and be discussing their fellow That's why there are less women in heaven than, than men. <laughs> I'm not the one that said it. I'll, next time I come, I'll play the tape for you. Go and buy the book. It's in the bookshops here. Heaven So Real. It's written by a lady from, I think it's a Korean woman, who Jesus took to heaven. He said when she got there, there are fewer women in heaven than men. Now, there's a Nigerian woman. This lady I'm talking about, is a pastor for 30 years. She got there. She was even asking the Lord, where are the women? Why? Too many men. I can show it to you in Ecclesiastes chapter 7. He said, I can found in a thousand men one. But he said in a thousand women it's hard to find one. See your Bible. If you want, I'll show you. What is the problem? What is the problem? Because the key that opened the door for the serpent is a lady. What is the issue? Emotion. 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 Emotion, emotion, hot, negative emotion is what we are talking about. So, what are the women's three battles? First, you can see, I'll put a enmity between her and the devil, the demons. Number two, wahala in childbirth. Genetic salvation. So, the things that Adam caused is their freedom from it. 
Jesus went to the cross, the second Adam, to correct what the first Adam damaged. There is now deliverance from childbirth. Enmity, I mean, uh, 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 pain in childbirth. And you know, for women, it happens in three dimensions. First is the battle to, to conceive. That's why a lot of, you know, you know, gynecology is a big business with the modern things they've discovered now. When they finish conquering that and conceive, the chances of dying in childbirth. I hope you know that maternal mortality it used to be one out of every hundred women in this country that must die. One out of every hundred women that go. Now the case now, whether they're even saying it's one out of ten now. That's why for men, if your wife is pregnant, please find the best medical personnel. Remember that when Pharaoh wanted to kill the male children in Egypt, the people he gave the contract were the midwives. So you have to know who the doctors and the midwives are. Get the best hospital for your wives because that battle is a battle of life and death. A lot of women have lost their lives there. If you truly love your wife, what you do when she's delivering matters. Here is the point. Then the third area they face the battle. The child is now born. Within the first five years, all types of things to make sure that child survives. That most vulnerable period. You say 5 million die of malaria every year. Just malaria. Before we talk about other things. Kids under age, age 5. The last battle is your desire will be to your husband and he will rule over you. Three battles follow women there to find the man. Now after they find him, they're having problem in marriage. And then if the marriage breaks, the woman is usually more damaged. Because women are more emotional, more relational than men. Not that it doesn't affect men, it does. Your desire shall be to your husband. See how a woman is delivering now with all the challenges of childbirth. Next time, is he coming around the man? I think after one child, better no woman will want to near a man. Na lie. He came from Eden. All this hair you are doing, who are you doing it for? Men. It's not your fellow women. All these tight skirts and who are, who are you doing it for? Men. Who are, whose attention are you looking for? Men. Stop pretending. <laughs> Jeans, bed, whatever. Who? Men. Where is your headache coming from? The same men he will rule over you. Men, their own is power. Wahala. Go and see now. Look at how they are fighting over number now. They are fighting in business, economic power. They are fighting in the company. To earn a living money. When they finish that, the woman they love again is their headache. Sex. It's when you are through with the foundation of genetics, genetic problem, which is Adam, you now come to your family line. So, if you want to solve the one that came from Eden, there are solutions for it. And we don't really have the time, but I will show you this scripture, just in case, just in case. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, uh, uh, 11. Now, any woman, any woman here that wants to conquer what three causes that came on Eve. Take note. That has come on all women. Take note. Let your women learn in silence with all subjection. You might not like it. But that's where God put the solution. That the first law for deliverance from childbirth and all of that is submission. God wants a lady to to be under authority. When she's at home under her father, when she marries under her husband. You see? The man might be under his father, but once he marries, he's free from 
his father and he's on over a woman. But he's subject to government in the society, subject to in the church. But in that domestic setting, he runs, this. he's the head there, but the lady is asked to be under authority because she was the opening for the fall to occur. That's how God put that order. So let her learn in silence with all subjection. All, all, all. Anyway, verse 12. I do not allow a woman to teach or to have authority over the man, but to be in silence. He's talking about her husband. Do you want to be open to demonic assault or do you want to be under protection? So one of the reasons for authority is protection. That's what we represent with this head tie that you put as a woman. A sign of authority. And your long hair. That's what it means. I'm under authority. And you should not be praying or prophesying or preaching without that. Anyway. Verse 13. Adam was first formed, then Eve. Adam was not deceived. But you can see the woman being deceived went into transgression. Adam was not deceived. He just followed his wife. It was outright disobedient. He knows, but he followed her because of what we told you. Three problems of men. Anyway, it's the same thing you see with Solomon, David, all the major. Then verse 15. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbirth. Watch the other four conditions for deliverance on childbirth. If they continue in faith. So sum, submission is number one. Number two is faith. That's what we teach under supernatural childbirth. You should find those tapes. Faith. Number three is charity. Love. If you want freedom from harassment from the cause on the woman, you must start walking in love. Not just walking in faith. Stay away from malice. Stay away from gossip. Stay away from envy. Stay away from those things. Matters of the heart. And the devil will lose his power over you. You conceive, he lives. You conceive, he lives. There are conditions. Five. Submission is one. You are the stubborn type. You don't submit. You are looking for trouble. This is the kingdom. This is the constitution. Jesus has corrected what Adam did. There are also conditions for delivering men from the cause that came on her. Jesus has reversed it. You don't have to be poor anymore. You don't have to struggle to make money anymore. You make the thing goes down again. Mm -mm. You don't have to fall into temptation to women anymore. Now see, submission is number one. Have a covering on your life. Number two is your faith life. You have to be warded up so faith comes by hearing. Number three is your love life. Number four is holiness. You cannot be living a dirty life and expect deliverance from childbirth. One of the worst scenarios I've seen is you see married women who do not know that they are married. Who are you still advertising for? You bring your boobs. Are you not ashamed? Are you not ashamed? And you call Jesus' name with your mouth. He said, women should dress in modest apparel. It's there. We jumped it. Please go back and show it to them. And likewise, also women should adorn themselves in modest apparel. We shame for God said you should have shame as a woman. Stop dressing like a harlot. You are a child of God. Shame, shame. There are things you should be ashamed to wear. And with sobriety, sobriety is self-control. Sobriety, self-control. That's what a woman, you want to be the new Eve, the one that has been set free from the curse. These are the five conditions. Sobriety, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. Those things does not keep marriage. They might attract a man, but they don't, they don't keep him. If, if mini skirt is what makes marriage work, there will be no marriage problem. First Peter 3 uh, said, is the inward beauty of a meek and a quiet spirit. 
So it is when he finished this, he now said, you add the other elements and there's deliverance on childbirth. But there's one I didn't add. I said, I said, you know, if she continues in faith, in walking in love, in holiness, and uh, in self-control, I think that's the last thing he mentioned there. Eh? Sobriety, self-control. Go back, you see it, in verse 15. They continue in faith, in charity, in holiness, and in what? Self-control. Control yourself. Control yourself. And it's not just anger. It's talking about emotion that is running wide. Because that's why some ladies, just that a guy has greeted them, they have lost control. The bell rings, the guy opens his door, he sees you with your bag. What are you doing here? I came for a weekend. Are you crazy? Has he married you? Go and listen to my tape. The laws of engagement. You see why we lose a lot of dates. The man had a mind to marry. You're packed weekend. Next thing you are washing his pants, you're washing his singlet, you're cooking for him. Are you his wife? Once somebody can get it free, they start postponing going to see your parents. Two years pass, five years pass. But, but a wise woman knows you. You have to be there. Be nice to him. But keep that a little edge. Keep him on the pursuit. And he will go and do all the things fast. Don't make a man look like you are a market that nobody wants to buy. Just carry yourself. Just. You are a king's daughter. You have value. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are a creature of high value. Can somebody say amen? amen? Help me to greet your neighbor. Tell him, Your Excellency. Amen. Tell him, your, your Majesty. Amen. Let nobody treat you anyhow. But respect everyone. These are genetic problems. But the most dangerous, this is very dangerous. Because after I saw that Jesus reversed the thing, where he carried the, thorn, the crown of thorn, he took my poverty on his head. That sofa head will not come on this head. I vowed that everything Jesus died for, I will not allow it to touch my head. The same way, when they pierced his side and blood and water came out, he eradicated the cause of childbirth. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying? To give birth to you and I, the new creation, it had to pierce his side. It destroyed permanently what Adam brought. Even the Hebrews, who were not born again, but because of the Abrahamic covenant, the Hebrew women were not like the Egyptian women. They don't go through this nonsense. How much more? The godly woman, the Christian woman, can I hear an amen? amen? So you take care of the spiritual. You also take care of the natural. Dominion is a combination of the spiritual and the natural. We've taught that. And take care of this stuff. Then in the natural, have a good hospital. Don't go and end up in the hands of Egyptian midwives paid by Pharaoh. To either assassinate the mother or the baby. I'll leave that parable like that. In conclusion, Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. On Sunday, I did not address the Garden of Eden. I addressed the family section of genetic problem. It's three levels. Adam, your ancestors, then finally it gets to you. So if you take care of the Adamic one, there is another level. There is another level. Your own father, your own mother, their own parents, you can check it to three or four generations. Every man's devil is his father's devil. Every man's devil is his father's devil. Every man's devil 
is his father's devil. Study your mother. What she went through. And you can tell what your own challenges are. That's why it's called genetic. Challenges we get by inheritance. The mystery now is that demons are spirits. They don't die. They come into a family. They finish dealing with a generation. That generation dies. They, they leave the dead bodies. As you are lowering the corpse, they have even left. Once the bread ceases, they leave. They enter the next generation and continue. Some even do it while the forebears are alive. That's why if you can't trace something in the immediate parents you have, you look at their own parents, you'll find it. If you win an election and you take somebody's seat, you studied the war that person faced. Studies. Enemies of Saul were glorious. And they didn't bother David. Because Saul was king. But the day David stepped into that office, that very day, they came and refuted him. And encamped against him. They fought. David was giving sign. If you see a sign on the mobile tree, go. I've given you victory. He defeated them. The next time, next year, they gathered the same place. But changed strategy. Till David died, the Philistines were his avowed enemies. Because your father's enemies are your enemies. Find the battles he fought, and you will know what you are going to be fighting. But kill those demons ahead and make your life easier. It's called family tree. Now the question is, how do you solve the problem? And that's where we, we you, what, what you came for. Second Chronicles chapter seven verse fourteen tells us what to do in dealing with family generated issues, deliverance generated issue. The first thing is awareness. You need knowledge. You need to know. You know the truth. The truth will make you free. When you don't have light, you don't have knowledge. You'll be busy poking. You know, like where you are treating a sickness without diagnosis. Today you take aspirin, tomorrow you try Panadol, tomorrow you try this, today you think it's headache, tomorrow you think it's malaria, the next day you think it's typhoid. The lab should show you. What is the lab? Look at your generational line, you look at your family line. The key to the future is to look, at, look back in history. Then Second Chronicles chapter 7, he said, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves. Before he gave this solution, he mentioned about seven types of generational problems, which I don't have the time to go into. But he said, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves. So the first key to, hum to deliverance is humility. The first key to salvation is also humility. Because without humility, you can't repent. Well, the second key is repentance. Without humility, there won't be repentance. But humility and repentance constitute 70% of deliverance. There cannot be deliverance until there is humility. Pride will not allow. The pride insulates the devil and gives him a stronghold to hide in. Why are you defending your sickness? You can never. He said, he that covereth his sin will not prosper. 
he that confesseth and forsaketh them will what? Will have mercy. It's just pride. But that's what the devil does. He hides under it. So that he can keep perpetuating the evil. That doesn't mean that the men may not have their problem. It's possible that if you study, it might be stubbornness or it might be another thing. Or, but there has to be something to create that. It's generational sin that perpetuates generational cause. The next generation come, they repeat the sins of their ancestors. If it is a place where they don't forgive, they will repeat it. If it is where they gossip, they will repeat it. If it is where they are very stubborn, they will repeat it. If it is where they are very divisive, division, quarrel, strife, they will start the same thing again. The same evil spirits will rise, repeat the same problems in the next generation, and then they will go again. It will come in the upper generation. It will instigate them with the same thing. But there is a way to stop it. The first is to humbly look at the thing and see what is going on and in humility before God. Then he said, humble themselves and turn from their wicked ways. There is prayer, there is seek my face, but turn from their wicked ways. Is in the order you execute it. That's repentance. Repentance is 70% deliverance. You see all this shouting, come out, come out. The first thing is remove the legal ground that the devil has. And it is the sin that empowered it to operate. Devils are like policemen. They look for where there is a broken law. Where you break the hedge, the serpent come in to bite. They look for that, those openings where conditions have been met. Then they now come to prosecute. So the first thing is to remove that their legal ground. That gave them the warrant of arrest. And how to do it is through repentance. Once I humble myself before God, this is what is happening in my family. I want to have a good marriage, Lord. I humble myself before you. I realize that these are the kind of things that have been happening. And I repent of my own sins. The way I've also played into the hand of these family demons. The way I have acted in the ways of my own ancestors. The way, you know, if you see when the Jews went into 70 years of captivity, how Daniel prayed. He didn't say, our people have sinned. He said, we have sinned. He identified, realizing that he is in Babylon because he was part of the issue. He didn't point it in a way. You will never remove a generational cause or problem as long as you point it away, looking for who to blame it on. You have to take ownership. Look at how Nehemiah prayed. Look at how Ezra prayed. And all of them, every time they finish, they break that captivity. A girl grows up, nobody's asking for marriage. But she's so pretty. There's something wrong somewhere. It's in the family tree. Repentance. Then, you now come to prayer. And what you do here is, you know, after repentance, you renounce that, those causes. Everyone say, I renounce. I renounce. Every, covenant Every covenant made on my behalf. <laughs> knowingly or unknowingly. I renounce it in the name of Jesus. Every cause that is running in my family line, that is trying to affect me again in my own time, I renounce it in the name of Jesus. Then the last part is that we are going to come against the powers that are behind all this. They bind those devils and command them to stop their works and maneuver in your life. You have right to freedom. Because Jesus has paid for your freedom. Can I hear you say amen? amen? You're going to bind them. They attack your business. You bind them to stop their manipulations. Wherever it is coming from. And as you deal with it, if they have hired somebody and they are using someone, maybe it's a native doctor somewhere doing something, that altar will collapse. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying? No charm works except evil spirits get involved in it. The real thing that makes charm is not the leaves, it's evil spirits. Stop being afraid of the things they tie. Bind the devil that is in that stuff. And that thing will be nonsense. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying? Stop being afraid of a good hair or good ear. Speak to the power behind it. Use spirit that has come through this token.
to cause problem in this family, I command you to leave. You have authority over devils. You have authority over any kind of demon. In the name of Jesus. That's what he died to give you. It's called the power of attorney. The right to use his name. The right to exercise authority over demons. Can I hear you say amen? amen. You command the spirit of barrenness to live. You command that spirit of strife to live. You command that spirit of confusion to live. That spirit of division commanded to leave. But it starts with repentance. What repentance does is to remove 70% all the legal ground. That's why it's all. Repentance is the first step to restoration. Sometimes something has gone bad or something has, even between people. Repentance. I am sorry. Uh, forgive me. You know healing has started. As long as people are in pride, they don't want to come down and apologize. There will never be reconciliation. But it's the same thing with God. There is, must be humility. And then you apologize. Father, I bring repentance for myself and my whole family. For whatever that has happened in this place that is causing this problem. I bring repentance. Even for the sins of my own ancestors. For the sins of my fathers, for the sins of my mothers. Whatever transpired. Some places they dumbled into the occult. Some places they killed human beings. Some places a married woman committed adultery and opened the door for a spirit of waywardness to come. Some places all kinds of things happened. Some places they cheated somebody else and the person died out of broken heart. And when such a thing happened, he leaves a curse behind. You see what Paul is saying. We wrestle not against what? Flesh. If you don't arrest the spirit behind the situation, you have not solved the problem. I want us to go on our knees. This place is, is rock, though. We're going to, for the, I'm going to lead you in two type of, two set of prayer. The first is humility and repentance. Bring not only for yourself, but what is happening in your family. 